everybody, this is Ross. Uh, welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys. Every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern, we talk a lot about fruits, a lot about vegetables, a lot about figs. And um, tonight's episode is no exception. We're going to be talking about sort of what my plans are for the future with the fig trees and uh, what I expect kind of to happen this season. If anyone has any suggestions as to some um, topics we should do, um, I'm all ears. I think what I should do and what I want to do next week is actually do a live stream. Um, I do miss these episodes of Fruit Talk. We haven't done them in quite some time and I've kind of gotten out of the habit of doing them every week and also out of the habit of doing a video every day. Um, although we are putting out a lot of content, I think um, it's nice to do that that structure that we used to have. Um, there's just a lot of things going on and uh, a lot of things that I want to do in life and uh, it's not always working out the way I want. You know, There's just not enough time in, a, in the day as you guys know. So um, yeah, in this video let's just talk about some things I am expecting for this upcoming season um, and what my plans are. So I think first off, right off the bat, I had a lot of a lot of trees last year. What we had done in, in prior years is actually combined a lot of the trees and had multiple varieties in the same pot. I even had some like three or four varieties in one single pot. And I just, um, I think that's not a bad method of doing it. Um, however, when it comes to getting rid of some of these varieties, it's a lot more difficult than um, I would have preferred. I think it's super easy to just have them, I think, experimentally in five gallon size pots. And then if you don't want them anymore, you can either sell them locally, give them away, um, or you can bare root them, which I think is probably the best way and the easiest way is just uh, bare root them in the fall, shake off all the soil. And I shipped out so many of those trees this past fall. And I know you guys really, whoever got them should really be appreciating them this year. Um, I can't believe, um, I actually have a few more that I want to ship out to people um, that I haven't listed yet on FigBid. We'll see what those end up being and if I have really the time to do it. Um, I'm not entirely sure if I'm going to be doing that just yet, but um, I think it's a wonderful thing that if you're done experimenting with some something, there's got to be somebody out there who wants it, um, could get good use out of it, especially at that point when you get rid of it. It's probably already at least two years old, right? So it's probably a pretty good established tree, and uh, a lot of people can benefit from it rather than just tossing it away or throwing it in the compost pile. You know, it's... Uh, it's something I think that we can definitely benefit from by doing it like this. So it's easier for me and it's better for everybody else is just to grow them in the five gallon size pots and have them for that purpose of experimentation, figure out what varieties are going to make the cut here and which ones aren't. And I sort of, uh, it's kind of unfortunate really the way that I approach this because I almost think that I'm sort of wasting my time with some of these varieties already. I was very selective, very careful with what I had acquired this year and rooted this year. And there's a pretty decently complete, it's not totally complete list here of the different varieties in the spread, in the spreadsheet that I, I um, keep up to date for you guys to even just look at if you ever wanted to. Um, this is in the to-do spreadsheet list here and this is kind of really just keeping track of what it is that I have left to do and a number of these I've already put them into five gallon size pots and I have close to another 25 maybe 30 of them that need to go in these five gallon size pots maybe even more I think maybe even 30 um, and I've already got quite a bit because from last year like I said we had rooted some and those worked out pretty well, but I had put them with other varieties in the same pot. And I just, like I said, figured we just should have them in their own pot, in the five gallon size pot. So I took all those from last year, put them in the five gallon size. Whatever was in a five gallon size, 
that I really like and I really wanted to have copies of and it was uh, of uh, the right size it had some age to it um, it was pretty well rooted in that pot I then up potted that into a 10 gallon size pot and or a 15 and the 10 or the 15 size is really what I would consider a keeper we still have some 10 and 15 sizes that I'm still evaluating and probably will um, get rid of at some point um, but inevitably what is really coming down to it here is that I'm making a very big transition over to growing figs in the ground and that's really the whole kind of you know thing I want to talk about in this this episode of fruit talk is that you just can't be growing them in the ground in terms of the effort required the money required um, and now with the help of these low tunnels that I have and I'm setting them up you know I still haven't gotten the plastic guys I did that video so long ago it feels like uh, just because of what's going on they're really struggling to get all this stuff shipped to people and it would have been nice to have had this low tunnel um, 45 days ago is realistically in a, in a normal year when I would have gotten this on and everything would have been going at that point so we're really falling behind at this point and you know I, I would I would have probably gotten it if, ever, if nothing was wrong in the world right now <laughs> I would have gotten the, the plastic around the 1st of April and that would have been a great head start but now we're 15 days later we're pretty close to that May 1st mark and that's kind of putting us in I think a little bit of trouble and um, yeah I'm only gonna have probably these these low tunnels set up for roughly a month and a half and for me that just doesn't seem to be uh, I don't know. I feel like I'm missing something here. I feel like it's not... It's just not going to be as spectacular of a season as I thought based off... It, it's just so weird, maybe. You know, maybe I shouldn't be thinking about it like that because I only missed 15 days. You know, I really missed 45 days, but um, it was. it's almost been two weeks since I ordered the plastic. So I don't know. Um, maybe I should just be a bit more positive on this this whole thing and uh, stop worrying because I'm sure it's all going to work out. And um, I'm going to have a I should have I'm going to have a fantastic season. I will. Um, as fantastic as it could have been, I don't know. But the point is, is that uh, you know, really, when we get all this stuff ready, and because the the in ground trees are still so young anyway, you know. I, to expect really anything out of them this year is it's just such a nice benefit. I'm hoping it's going to supplement the missing potted trees that we have because we do have a lot less potted trees as I've been planting a lot of them in the ground. I got rid of a lot of them. As I told you guys, I bare rooted so many of them. So we need this in-ground production to really step it up and uh, supplement the, uh, the production here. Um, now it's okay because you know again a lot of these trees are young I just planted so many of them again this year I took a lot of them out of the ground I put a lot of them in I don't even know how many at this point I planted this year but um, it's quite a bit we designated the front of the house for an area for a hardiness experiment so I took some up out of the ground there my multi black my improved Celeste we talked about in a video that we did on YouTube um, you know how I dug those up we looked at the root systems so I've been taking those and I've been you know putting them in different places around the yard underneath these low tunnels and that's just kind of all in preparation I think for really next season and really realistically even the season after that because again these trees are still so young um, really by that third year I should be expecting some really good production out of all the trees um, I'm only gonna have about four trees that have been in the ground for three years underneath a low tunnel so um, we'll see what happens with the production on those but um, yeah it's only four trees you know so next year is gonna be a lot more because the, the I'm gonna have trees that be entering their third season uh, next year a lot more of them 
you know, probably I would say at least half of the trees I have in the ground. And then the following year after that, then it's going to be all of them or close to all of them will be on that third year. Um, so I'm excited. I, I am. I really am excited to see what's going to happen. I wish I had the plastic so that I could really be excited because I feel like things are staggering and things are not going well. At least it seems like outside. The weather is so strange here, guys. Um, the last couple weeks have been so weird for me because it really, really this last week we had so much wind like we had a tornado watch today um it's also been quite cold we almost had two potential frosts that came in and then actually i think thursday morning friday morning is also two more potential frosts and if we're to get these frosts it's not good um because almost everything in the yard is blooming or has bloomed so this would mean i would get almost next to nothing in terms of production this year from a huge number of different fruits that i grow um and that would be very upsetting especially if i you know can't i can't protect everything i came to the conclusion that on one of these frost warnings it was pretty windy i said you know what it's windy it's probably not going to have any we're not going to have any frost um and it was above 32, it was around 36. So I figured, you know what, I'm not even gonna protect anything. In fact, I even had citrus trees out there. Excuse me guys, so yeah, I don't think this upcoming frost either, I'm gonna really pay attention to the weather and see if it's really all that necessary to protect some things. Um, if it is, we're going to be out there probably on Thursday doing as much as humanly possible to protect as much as I can because I think that's the big day. If we get past this week, I think we're pretty much golden for the rest of the season. Um, there are some other things that are not really going well, I think, recently, and I've just been – it's just a struggle, I think, with all this weather. Um, I haven't been getting my seeds really to go all that well for me. I've been trying to start tomatoes and peppers and it's just been failure after failure after failure. Um, the, the cold ton or the, um, the cold frame, I also have some seeds that I've been trying to start in there. Broccoli, I've been transplanted broccoli in there, small plants. And I think I just have a big slug problem in there. I finally figured it out why this wasn't happening for me. It was driving me crazy. I was like, why am I not getting the germination? I, I should have at this point and it really just comes down to those slugs so um, I'm gonna have to without a doubt uh, figure out some way to plant some seedlings in there that are then protected from slugs and um, in addition <laughs> the mesh that I use on top of my crops to keep things warm and get the seedlings up and going uh, a lot of it's starting to rip because it's not the best material, number one. Number two, it's been super, super windy. It's been insane. Um, so it's just a giant. The whole thing in the last week has been a giant mess for me. But, you know, let's go back to the figs. I wish something would go right, I think. Um, I think that's where my worries and troubles are stemming from. So... Yeah, so we're going to be in, in business, I think. We put enough enough of these trees in the ground this year. I still have more to put in the ground. Um, and the reason for all this, we didn't. I guess we didn't get into it, but it is the low tunnels. We did the video on the low tunnels explaining it, but I don't think a lot of people fully grasp the concept there and what I was really trying to get at. Because um, it's not really about, you know, it's it's... I don't even remember, to be honest with you, what some of these some of you guys were kind of struggling with, but the whole idea, just very simply, is that with the low tunnel, they get an extremely early head start. They get so much heat that they then put out a lot of fruit at an earlier date, and um, it's just an absolute no-brainer. I mean, they're going to be way, they're going to be leagues ahead of what the potted figs do that don't get a head start on my patio. 
they're going to be behind the greenhouse in terms of production, in terms of the dates, but they're not going to be behind the, the greenhouse in terms of production. They're going to be way more productive because they're in the ground. They're not in pots. Um, and that's really what the low tunnel does. It's incredible, I think. And I guess this is part of it is that some people just don't understand what it's like having a fig tree in a greenhouse in the spring. It is insane. It's like a huge difference. Um, it's nuts. People don't really get it unless you experience it. And I don't blame them. Um, I don't blame you guys if you don't understand it because how could you? You know, um, you know, it's hard to to really fully comprehend something unless you really experience it for yourself. So um, I I just think it's so uh, it's such a big deal that. Um, you know, it's it's just going to be a no-brainer. Why should I even have potted figs anymore? And I was even skeptical to even up-pot some of the figs I have into larger pots because I figure, why, if I like them so much, I should just put them in the ground, right? That's really been my whole philosophy now is that if I had originally put some very experimental things in the ground to see if they would do well and see what things would be like, but now I figure the experimentations for the pots and it's been reversed. So I even dug up some things, put them in pots to continue the experimentation. But now I'm like, well, why am I even keeping some of these? You know, I had, you know, goals of up potting some of this, these varieties here into larger pots. Um, there's even more of them in addition to this list. You know, I wanted to air layer some of these here. Um, you know, I have some things here for rootstock to graft on these particular varieties so that I can have many more copies of these in pots, you know, um, because you don't want to plant a grafted tree in the ground, even though it will be, they will be all be protected. I just don't think it's the greatest idea. So it kind of just, uh, it, it just doesn't make sense. I think this whole way of doing everything I've been doing the last however many years it doesn't it doesn't make sense anymore so I am uh, really trying to change the way I'm thinking and it's been difficult because I've been thinking the one the one way for so long that uh, now I'm just completely doing a 180 and changing everything that I used to do and it's difficult to put myself in that mindset right now so I even have aspirations of putting some more, more, I might mind you, cold de dom figs varieties in the ground. And that's other that's the other part of this whole crazy thing with the low tunnels, is that these low tunnels are gonna give me the ability to plant late varieties in the ground. You know, I probably shouldn't still shouldn't plant the very late varieties like my Dell's Ermatons and De La Senora Hivernanka and my Black Madeira, UC Davis. You know, those are just, forget about that whole thing. Um, planting those in, um, in the ground or anything like that. But these varieties that I, I didn't really think, I thought they were later than they were. And the greenhouse really kind of expanded my mind. I really learned a lot this year as to what, varieties will just very easily fruit given uh, a ton of heat and that's what the low tunnel does right the low tunnels will be similar to the greenhouse without the heater without that little space heater that I have um, but they will have more sunlight so it's going to be a comparable amount of heat not not an exact comparison but the point is is that um, they're going to trigger the same way that they're bolting and triggering in the greenhouse. They're going to do the same thing in these low tunnels. And it really didn't take me all that long. They woke up in the greenhouse. Three weeks later, they had fruit on them. Um, you know, you guys saw the videos. I was I was shocked. Uh, March 1st, my cold and on Blanc woke up. And then I think by March 20, 20th, somewhere on the 20th to the 25th, 
Um, a lot of these varieties had the beginnings of fruit on them. A lot of them, not just the Coldenon Blanc. Uh, you know, about a third of the figs in the varieties in the greenhouse had fruit on them three weeks after they woke up, which is incredible. Um, so that's going to happen again all the time, every year with these low tunnels. Maybe it's not three weeks, but it should be three weeks with the early varieties. I didn't have a single very, very early variety that was mature enough to put out fruit in the greenhouse within the within three weeks. Um, my Azores Dark and I think Caponieri now, and maybe Ronde Bardot are doing this around the four week mark but assuming that they were mature trees they would have done this two weeks after they woke up they would have the beginnings of fruit on them and the same thing would happen in the low tunnels but probably a couple weeks after that you know I can't assume the same time frame um, with the other trees so you know um, that's it that's really what's gonna happen is that uh, it's gonna be a night and day difference and I don't fully understand how anybody at this point could argue against having a low tunnel. If you have the ability to plant a low tunnel for your figs, you should do it. You really should do it. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that you could, if I really wanted to have some great season extension, I could probably go a little crazier than I am. Um, I could do this for my melons, my tomatoes, you know, all kinds of different things that uh, are, are lower growing in the spring. Um, so, you know, why not? Why the heck not? So um, that's what I'm thinking here, here guys, um, is that this is going to be just a complete game changer. And to have like a cold adam in the ground, I already have about half of them. I have the mutantes in the ground. That's really what I wanted to mention here. I have the mutant, the Coldedon mutantes. I have the Coldedon gigantinas in the ground. Both, all four of them, very young. Um, I'm gonna be planting the Coldedon roja and the noir, which is pretty much the same thing. It should be exactly the same fig. Um, according to Pons, I'm pretty sure he considers them both the same fig. The Noir and the Roja are the earliest of the Coldenoms, it seems like. I have talked to others. They think the Noir is earlier. Pond says that the Noir is earlier. My Blanc is a special, weird phenomenon, and other people have said the same thing about a similar Blanc that is heavy with the FMV. Uh, Harvey is an example. It's his earliest Coldenom. And it's very slow to grow, but puts out a lot of fruit. And it puts out earlier fruit. And um, his ripens earlier than his other Coldenoms. And he's got all different types, right? Um, my Coldenom Blanc seemed to put out fruit earlier than the others. However, uh, my Coldenom Noir seems just as earlier, if not slightly earlier, this year in the greenhouse. So. The plan is to put them all in the ground. The grease is the only one I really struggle with and debate in my mind as to whether or not I should plant the grease in the ground. But uh, it's interesting because they are becoming more mature trees, the coldenoms, with the help of the greenhouse plus the maturity. I think that's making a big difference here. And um, I'm really seeing the results and really the true nature of these cold anoms. They take some time to mature. It's unfortunate. Now, here's the real question, and I've sort of been debating this with Smith as well because I like Smith so much. And there's a couple other figs that have a similar issue. If you go over here to my, you know, special characteristics tab, we can see some figs that, um, Well, I didn't have this, uh, ah, here we go. I have a category here of hormonal imbalance. And I probably could even add some of these varieties over here that I would consider rootstock candidates. You could probably add some of these over here into the category of hormonal imbalance because some of the very, very quickly 
the fast growing varieties don't put out fruit all that easily um, because they suffer from a hormonal imbalance they and it almost seems like they grow very quickly um, because they're just not putting out fruit you know um, so th they can kind of be a weird little I don't know how to say it I guess a contradiction I guess in a way but uh, that's not the right word I'm sure but the point is is that the hormonal imbalance trees is kind of what I have in the ground you know those are the some of these varieties I have in the ground like improved Celeste the cold at arms would be Fico love in the ground I have some Adriatic types in the ground. I have Pastel de Air in the ground. I have Ronde Bordeaux in the ground. I have Smith, Sultane, Texas BA1, Victoria, Vila de Bordeaux. I have almost all of these in the ground. And I really like a lot of them. The issue is that with this particular system that I'm using, are they going to suffer from the hormonal imbalance? When you cut them back to 6 to 12 inches every year, that is a big detriment and sending us in the wrong direction of where we want to be in terms of hormonal imbalance. If they have hormonal imbalance, they need to be pruned very lightly, if at all. Um, and they need to be like that for years before they finally slow down and start to put on some fruit. So I worry about the cold knobs. I worry about Smith and I'm hesitant to put them in the ground. So there may be just a scenario where I have to just grow these particular fig varieties. Maybe it'll change if I have them in the ground for a certain amount of years. We're going to see how this all plays out. But, you know, I worry about it. And um, I would put all the Smiths in the ground, you know. I would. I would have, you know, as it stands right now, there's a number of varieties that don't really have that hormonal imbalance and seem to perform just as well as Smith, probably even better. And, you know, there was a thread recently on our figs that somebody said, if you can only have one fig variety on an island, you know, and you can only grow one variety, what would it be? And I think in, pri in prior years, I would have said Smith, or I would have said either Violet de Bordeaux, or I would have said Hardy Chicago. And um, like my Azores Dark or Malta Black, right? And, um, you know, nowadays there's, there's more varieties than just those three. There's a lot more varieties that I would have considered, you know, things like Nurecilla de Alba, Verdino del Nord, Campaneri, Moro de Caneva, different types of Celeste, um, even this Aishia Black. Um, there's way more than that that I could probably name. So there's a big list now of figs that I'm like all right well which ones are really really the best because I don't want to be making copies of something that isn't going to perform as well as something else and I don't think it's Smith will ever really be gone and it'll just be you know something I never grow again um, but you know, you have to think that if Nerucciola de Alba and Verdino del Nord are considerably a notch higher, considerably higher than Smith in terms of performance, um, you have to think, well, you know, it's going to get replaced at some point. And, and you would think as time goes on, um, I would rather most likely have more copies of Alba and Verdino del Nord than I would of Smith. And you could even just argue that, all right, I would replace all the Smiths that I have with those figs. And um, I know that's hard, and that's hard to do, and it's hard to say. It's hard to put into practice, but um, it's the truth. It's the truth. And you know what? Um, I'm not giving up on it because we still need more information from all these figs. Um, Smith is still, you know, at this point, my favorite, definitively. Um, but, uh, you know, I worry. <laughs> I worry about it. And, um, um, yeah, uh, yeah, I just think um, that's sort of the direction we're heading in. And, um, 
I'm really excited to see what this year is going to bring and what's going to happen and what everything's going to look like. It definitely seems like I'm going to have probably less fruit than, than last year. Um, but if the in-ground trees work out the way that they do, I'll have way more fruit than last year. Um, so there's a lot there's a lot to find out. There's a lot to learn this year. I'm eager. I'm itching to find all this information out. And uh, I keep getting sort of set back by different things. I'm doing different tasks, and then something happens, and I have to redo it. And this year it just seems like one of them uh, – weird times where that's just happening repeatedly <laughs> so um yeah uh i guess we can talk very briefly about some of the new varieties i got or some varieties i'm really looking forward to sorry guys my mouth is a bit dry I'm probably talking what for now i don't know close to an hour Has it been an hour? It probably hasn't been an hour, right, guys? I, I guess I'm way off. I have no way of knowing, to be honest with you. Um, oh, wait, no. We were 31 minutes. <laughs> so, I'm, so I'm just way off. Holy crap. Apparently, I've been talking. I thought I was talking for an hour. Really, it was only half of that. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we did do a video uh I don't know when it was, probably sometime in February, maybe even January, we talked about the varieties I'm looking forward to the most. And some of you guys were like, oh, well, what about this variety? What about that variety? You know, um, I think that list has certainly changed since this point because now I have these low tunnels and I'm probably going to get to taste every variety I have in the ground. I mean, I, I wouldn't unless they have just severe hormonal imbalance, I wouldn't think, I wouldn't doubt that um, I don't get to taste them all. And uh, so as an example, I think, um, let's go over some of them now. Uh, I really am excited and I've recently learned that the Paradiso I have, because there's a lot of Paradisos out there, guys. Um, the United States, I mean, the names of all these figs in the U.S. is just crazy. Everyone knows it that is into this kind of thing. But in the terms of Paradiso, there isn't a single fig in the United States that's named Paradiso that's actually the real Paradiso in Italy. That was depicted in Galicio's drawings. But I have one. I found it. I have it. I've been growing it. I air layered it off because I grafted it and then I air layered it off and I realized I probably should have just kept it right on there and um, but it was too late at that point I already had a full mass of roots on this thing but I propagated some cuttings and I've been rooting them and hopefully I have a couple copies because that one I'm really really excited for first off it's a really tasty fig I've had a lot of them at this point um, they don't do so well at the, at the eye and they're, they're split a lot, but they're a very, very tasty fig and it's quite early. Um, it's shockingly early and I didn't think that an Adriatic type, at least this is the, it's not really an Adriatic type, but it's quite similar to them. It's got the green skin, the red interior, right? It's one of the earliest green skinned red interior figs and there's a couple that I'm really looking forward to like Vertolino and Green Michurinska. So the three of them are going to be in this weird competition to see which one I think is going to be the best. And um, I think there's a lot of potential in the Paradiso that no one really is paying attention to. Not many people give too much credit to the Vertolino, but you know, if you look at Paolo Bologna's photos, and we talked about this in that other video, is that He's got a number of varieties that will ripen early and are very tasty. And those are the ones I'm looking forward to the most. You know, things like Vertolino, Brianzolo, San Baggio, um, Pisaludo. Um, let's see, what else we got here? There's uh, my top performing figs. We can just go down this list. Um, I guess Pastelier is is in that list as well. Ungirolo, 
this variety here, Verdino Giacomo, I'm really excited for. This one seems like an even better white Madeira number one, and people people just get fixated on the craziest things. We're gonna we have a white Madeira number one. I have a couple of them now. I have one in the ground, one grafted in a pot, and another one in a pot that I air layered. Um, actually, one I, I I have an air layer of one and I think I rooted one as well. So I may even have four of them potentially. But uh, the point the point is is that it's a good fig. I don't doubt it. And I haven't even tasted it yet, to be honest with you. But everybody that I know that I respect their opinion loves it. Um, I just have a hard time believing that there isn't something better than even that out there. And uh, of the photos I've seen, I'm not like, whoa, you know, I'm blown away. You know, I think that there's probably better figs out there for sure. I mean, even the Blanche de Duce Cezanne, I'm sure gives it a run for its money. And um, without a doubt, even Strawberry Verte. Um, yeah, I just think there's a, probably a lot of hype. There's a lot of them even. Um, Prosciutto is another one. Um you know, there's even another one I have that I was that I decided to grow, if I can remember the name of it. Um, let's see. But yeah, what I think will be even better is actually the Verdino Giacomo. Oh, the LSU Strawberry is another one that is actually supposed to be a lot like Smith. Um, shout out to Brian. I finally got that thing rooted. Um, I even have one in the ground, but I don't know if it's going to survive. We had stuck some cuttings in the ground late last last season. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of potential there with the uh, you know the Verdino Giacomo. Does anybody even know what that fig is? No. You know, there's very few people, if anyone, that has it other than me, and um, I'm happy to have it. I really am. I think it's uh, going to be a real winner. And I'm happy to send it to people um, when my plant gets a bit older. I put one in the ground. It's basically a Adriatic type, it seems like, with drying capabilities. So it's, it should have a better um, better potential here. You know, If it has drying capabilities, um, that puts it way above things like Strawberry Verte and JH Adriatic and White Madeira Number One. That's just another notch higher than all the other figs, just because of that one little detail. Particularly here in this climate, you know, you just can't beat um, something like that here. And you know what else is that? It's not like it's a bad fruit, even in a warm place. Um, the pictures I saw, they just look stunning. Um, another variety that I'm really excited for that's new, uh, that I haven't even, I'm probably not going to get to taste yet. Maybe I will. Probably unlikely is the Parola. And, uh, this is a Portuguese fig that I was really shocked to find that has incredible taste qualities to it. Um, the photos I've seen just completely blow me away there are people in the U S with it. And I don't think it's, uh, it's been talked about really at all ever. Um, I think Harvey has it and Francisco had it and was talking about it on figs for fun years ago. Um, hopefully it's common. I really don't know if it is common. I will get to taste the Colonel Lippmann's. That'll be fun. Um, I may even get to taste, Probably won't get the taste called Arona, but we'll see. It's it's pretty likely actually that I'm going to get to taste a lot of these that uh, I just rooted really three four months ago. You know, um, with the way things are going and with these low tunnels, who knows? You know, um, who am I to say that I won't taste it? Uh, the Lampira one is supposed to be a very tasty fruit cold it on qualities to it there's a couple figs that i'm really looking forward to with those cold it on qualities i think one is a uh, brocolette brocolette if i'm not mistaken 
um, Lampira 1, Parola seems a lot like Coldenom. Um, La Bourgeoisie. Uh, let's see. There's another one here that I'm kind of blanking on. There's a Nin fig that uh, a friend of mine sent me this winter. Uh, that reminds me, at least looks very similar to a Coldadom. I have a fig that's from Italy that reminds me a lot of a Coldadom. Um, I've been kind of just going after some figs that really are going to resemble that cold and arm to find something maybe potentially even better. Um, there's one I'm mentioned. I've, I'm just completely blanking on. I wish I remember the name. Oh, it's a Pons fig that I picked up. I know Brocolette is one of them. Let me see if I can find the name here. Um, Parajolina looks really good as well, guys. Um, there's the Brocolette. See, I probably removed some of these off this list, and uh, that kind of messed things up, I imagine with my full list of figs here but hmm. maybe it just is the broccolette I'm thinking of something else but I did also get what people are not really aware of because they don't read unfortunately they just see a big name like call the Rona and they're like oh that's the one I want uh, believe it or not if you read the book or even Pons' website, you'll see that Calderona de Minor is probably a much better fig here than Calderona. Uh, they are very similar figs, just like the hardy Chicago types. However, they have different characteristics due to minor adaptations like the hardy Chicago types. And believe it or not, the Calderona de Minor Judging from how, how it's, it's earlier, it has a shorter crop window. It seems to be, I think, even more rain resistant. Um, it should be a much better choice here than even just Calderona. Yet nobody has even given that any thought, which is kind of mind blowing, I guess. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I probably will get to taste taste the Calderona de Minor, and uh, before I can even taste the Calderona. And that fig, like I said, it just seems uh, way better off than some others. Um, there's a bunch of French figs I'm looking forward to as well, guys. And we've talked about that in, in other videos. Um, let's see, what did we acquire? What else did we acquire? I think Great Black is a fig that Harvey was selling, and I think it has Greek origins to it. So I'm not sure if it's common. Uh, a lot of the Greek figs just seem to be Smyrna's or they just need a long time before they hold on to their fruit. And that's unfortunate. Um, <clears throat> but this fig looked so good that I couldn't pass it up. The great black fig. You can see Harvey's video that he did on it. I picked up a couple varieties from Harvey this year that seemed way better than... Um, and or under the radar than what you would have expected. Um, I think there's a bunch of names out there. People keep, you know, thrown around as, of course, this is how it works, right? Some things get promoted for the craziest of reasons. And um, at the end of the day, I think the Great Black and Parola, Princessa is another one. These ha all have potential that I picked up from Harvey to have. Uh, some of the highest fruit quality that uh, you can find for sure um, I have a, also a hardy Chicago trial that's going on Norella, Kesariani, Black Greek um, Red Lebanese Baca we have the Zor's Dark, we have the Malta Black we have the uh, even potentially hardy Hoboken if it roots for me shout out to Bill 
Um, and then I also have uh, the one from Dom. I'm blanking on the name. Uh, Sangua Dulce. That's the other one. So we have a big trial going on of those. We're going to have a big trial going on of the Grease Day St. Jean figs. What is the Grease Day St. Jean figs? Well, there's a bunch of different strains of Grease Day St. Jean. There's one up in um, Pruce Park that Harvey sells. It's actually there at the park that I think UC Davis has, and it should be the same thing as U the UC Davis version. Um, however, that one, a lot of people, for whatever reason, claim and say that it's not a legitimate Grease Day St. Jean, which I think is nonsense. Um, but there's some others out there. I picked up a legit, like a legit French source of Grease Day St. Jean that should be a, you know, as legit as it gets. Uh, because I've been finding that with my DN Manel, that's the Pons version of Grease Day St. Jean. He doesn't like it all that much. He doesn't think too much of it, too highly of it. I agree. Um, you know, that one, I think, uh, is a good fig. Is it, at the end of the day, it is Grease Day St. Jean, but there's better strains, I think, out there of it. And we're going to find that out. And for, you know, for definitely it doesn't seem D.N. Manel. It doesn't seem to match up with Pons's descriptions. Um, not Pons's descriptions. It doesn't match up with Bode's descriptions. It doesn't match up with most of the French writings and information descriptions that are out there on Grease de Saint Jean. It's a well documented fig. It's all over the world. It's used for many reasons. Um, it's widely grown. Yet the DN Manel really doesn't match up. Why doesn't it match up? I think uh, there's good reason for that. I think it's a strain that's just inferior. And we'll find out because I also have things like Loretta, which is another strain of it. And also there's one other one here. Katato. These are from Thierry. And uh, yeah, those are varieties that are of course different strains of Grace Day St. Jean and they should maybe even have potential to do and taste better than uh, a really as, as standard of a Grace Day St. Jean as you can get or a legitimate Grace Day St. Jean as you can get. Um, yeah, so that'll be interesting. You know, we've got a bunch of different stuff going on here. Um, we've got the one fig that's hopefully rooting right now. This is a type of blue Celeste. Um, yeah, I don't really have too much out. I don't really have too many figs this year that haven't already been proven in some way. There's very, very few of them that are complete unknowns to me, you know, um, which is good. You know, I don't want to be the guinea pig. I don't want to be the one having to find this out. All these California seedlings that are coming out that I people are really talking about on our figs. I made a thread to try to get people to post all their seedlings that they've been finding in one place. And, um, you know, my thoughts on, on that is that I think it's wonderful that a lot of you guys are going out there and finding these seedlings. It's incredible because we have such a uh, resource to pull from here in the U.S. Even just in outside of the wasp territory, there's a lot of trees that we could be discovering. There's two that I, in particular, would like to see if I can scout out this year and maybe even um, become friends with the owners and get cuttings of those trees after I see what the fruit is like. Um, so yeah, there, you know, there, there's a lot to be found out there. And, you know, I think seedlings, the issue with seedlings in general, it doesn't matter what it is, fig or not, they, a lot of times are not very good. Um, and some of them may look very good, but they may not actually be very good. Um, 
and you may you really have to ch get an eye for this kind of thing i think there's a lot of figs out there that may look fantastic but they just don't have the right characteristics to be growing here and you could sort of be te you could sort of tell you know by the cracking by the eye by the shape by the size by where the fig is located and what the environment is there how old the seedling is you know um, there's so many factors that go into this that it's just uh, I think incredible I, I, ought to I really ought to think that uh, some of these people who are finding the seedlings just should be, should be a bit more selective with whatever it is that they're growing and whatever it is that they're spreading around. Um, because you kind of have the choice of whatever you want. You know what I mean? Um, of course, the next best fig may come from California and one of these seedlings, but I think it's unlikely. It's more unlikely that uh, that that'll happen compared to something that's already been growing it's been established for a long time people who have been doing this over the years have been naturally selecting seedlings in Europe as an example they've been preserving them growing them for generations um, so you kind of in my mind have don't have the leg up on these other varieties and therefore it is important to uh to just very closely pay attention um now it's uh you know i don't want to discourage anybody that's doing this because i i do i think it's wonderful i think we need to be doing this there's so much out there there's so much we can lose genetically that uh it's just an it's a no-brainer of course but I'm not going to go out on a limb. I think this is really where I'm. What I'm saying, I'm trying to say, is that I'm not going to go out and say, "Oh, these seedlings are going to be the next best thing. We're going to have the best varieties ever come from these locations." I just don't think that's going to happen, especially for somebody in a place where I live. Um, the figs that I look for to do well here are a seedling or a fig that was grown in a climate similar to this similar to the where I live because it has adapted there so it should be a rainy humid place it should be in a colder area um, in a shorter seasoned area and if you get that and it adapts well in those locations over years you will have a good shot of it doing well here these seedlings in California are most of them are being grown in, in hot, dry, long season places, right? Um, not all of them, but uh, you know that's what you got to be careful of. Is you got to find within California is the right climate, like probably closer to San Francisco or closer to the coast or further north. That's where you want to be finding these things that would then translate well over here. You know, one that has pretty well has done pretty well over here, or should do well over here, is Thermalito that Doug found in California. Cause it is very early. It does have a tight eye. You know, um, that's the kind of thing that you guys ought to be paying attention to. At least for somebody here in this in this climate. Um, you know, if I could grow unknown pastillier, I would. It's just that it's not common. You know what I mean? So there's so many things that unfortunately have to go into this and <clears throat> too many questions need to be answered with these seedlings so far that I think we should just not jump to any conclusions just yet. Some of them do, however, look really good. I'll, I'll say that. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see, what else can we talk about here uh, with varieties, regarding varieties? One thing I've been kind of uh, hesitant to do is make multiple copies of something prematurely. And uh, if I have something like, as a good example, is a variety called Corinth. My buddy Danny loves it, raves about it, says it's a very early honey fig. 
Um, he likes it. I think he said something about the texture. Something sets it apart than other honey figs. Um, a couple people I know actually like it. And uh, even someone um, recently came to the in the in the um, in the fall. Someone came over for a local pickup and actually told me that that was the best fig they ever had. So I have high hopes for it. I put one in the ground because I have high hopes for it. However, I'm not uh, going to make a copy of it just yet and up pot it into a pot. Because I feel like if I'm going to have some of these pots, it needs to be limited. I don't know what the situation is going to be. You know, I'm kind of preparing, but I'm also not preparing. Because again, I'm trying to have less pots. I don't need all these pots. All the reasons I mentioned in this video with the low tunnels, they're just, pots are more work, they're more expensive, and they are less productive, and they fruit at a later date than the, the trees in the low tunnels. So, I just don't see a great reason to have many, many copies of them just yet. And um, I'm sort of hesitant. I would love to make copies of a bunch of different trees that I've mentioned in this video that I like and want to really have many copies of. But it's just, uh, it doesn't seem to be a good idea just yet. So that's what we're kind of waiting for here. We're, we're really, I'm keeping some of these in pots for the entire duration, even in smaller pots. I think it's going to be interesting to see what happens and, and what I change around from and learn this year till the fall. You know, I think it's going to be, again, another year of learning. It doesn't end. Um, figs are just incredible. You know, you just keep learning new and new and more things. Um, and these, these varieties, man, they, they impress all the time. Uh, I have to say, if you know, I really have been um, really enjoying the journey of finding and trialing all these different varieties. That's for sure. Um, yeah, it's it's been so interesting. Um, yeah, and also there's a whole debate as to what I should even have in the greenhouse next year. I made, there's going to be 30 trees in the greenhouse next year. I made a list of what would go in the greenhouse, but it seems like I may not even have this list anymore. I may even get rid of some of these figs. I may have a lot of them in the ground, like my De La Roca. I have a couple De La Rocas in the ground now. That's another incredible fig. Um, you know, things like even Delson Wami Grands in the ground. Um, you never know what I might do. I may end up just saying, let's get rid of some of these. Um, I don't know. All the cold adams are, for some reason, not even listed here. <laughs> and they would be listed here. I think what I had actually was thinking before I made this list was that the Coldenom Blanc was early. It was going to replace all the other Coldenoms. That it was significantly earlier, but I'm, I'm not finding that to be true. I'm finding that the Noir and the Roja to actually be slightly earlier than the Blanc. So we're going to um, put them all in the ground. Maybe not the grease. And uh, you never know. I may even put something... I think... Some of them that just, at, at the end of the day, um, I guess Planera and Moscatel Preto would make good greenhouse trees because they're going to ripen so early that they're going to not, I'm not going to really necessarily care about the splitting that they normally do. Same thing with Black Madeira or Italian 258, you know, so I could keep them in a pot in the greenhouse, but at the end of the day, I could probably get rid of these and replace it with any of these and probably be just as happy, if not happier. Um, you know, all the Smiths that I have now in 10 gallon size pots, I got about five or six or seven of them now. 
I don't even, I lost count how many I have that are in these bigger pots and they could very easily replace anything in this list here. <laughs> uh, just about anything except for maybe the De La Roca. Borgia Soak Grease is another really, really good one. So Socorro Black, Sucret. Yeah, we're going to find out, guys. We're really going to find out so much information. Um, the hardiness experiment that we're doing in the front of the house is going to consist of a number of varieties here. Um, these will, as I said, I'm designating an area specifically for to test their hardiness. They will not be protected. They will not be covered. They will be left on the, in the open. I'm, pl I'm spacing them very close together so I can fit as many trees in a small area that I can. That way if they do die back, which is probably expected, it's not a big deal anyway. If one of them does end up surviving, that's the one you keep. You could take out the others very easily. Um, so the trees that I'm going with, the hardiness experiment that I think have the highest chance of survival here, the highest hardiness rating of all the trees is a pastelier, but uh, a pastelier that is slow growing. The original pastelier, the real, the legitimate, the dwarf pastelier that is described, which uh, I actually have a, of a strain of it that should be the original, the legit pastelier. The pastelier from Rain Tree is very vigorous, and I think that is a bad thing um, for the lignification. If it's a very slow growing tree or it dies early, it should lignify quicker, therefore making it, and lignify better, it should making it uh, more hardy, right? So the pastelier, that's a big question as to whether or not that'll work. It's quite hardy. Uh, the Godfather Fig, the Demos Unknown, those are uh, surviving in New York City with no problem every year. That's pretty cool. LDA, Long to Do, of course, it's one of the hardiest figs that exists. It's worth trial in this uh, in this experiment here. Um, although expectations are a bit lower than others. Uh, Fico Love, this is one that... Uh, was getting good ratings of hardiness last year with a friend of mine a little bit less this year um, and it was quite mild this year so very strange I don't know why but uh, we'll see if love can pull through um, Floria this is arguably the hardiest fig that exists um, it really is either this or some sort of hardy Chicago is should be the one of the hardiest trees that is known, a known hardiness of reliability. Um, there are different hardy Chicago types that seem to do better than others. They're not all created equal. The hardiness rating of some of them is, is higher or lower than others. It's very strange. The Unknown Sicilian Dark is one that Big Bill recommended to me. And uh, that's one that I'm going with in the experiment. That's a, a hardy Chicago type that's hardy and productive. Lower on the taste. The Taramo Unknown, that's another one that Big Bill recommends. Um, that one's in Maryland, where the mother tree is. Not a very warm place, um, comparable to here. Uh, let's see, what else? We have Carmelit Tana. This is one that Herman is growing in his yard. It's new, not talked about. We have no way of talking to him, unfortunately. And I uh, figure it's worth a shot. If he's growing it, why not, right? Um, we have a fig called Lampira 1 that Thierry is uh, saying is very hardy. It's a negative 18 degrees Celsius, as well as Campaneri. Uh, again, both of them are supposed to be very, very hardy. Um, there's also St. Martin, which is said to have survived negative 20 degrees Celsius. This is crazy, right? Um, so there's a number of them. There's a number of these varieties that we're going to trial that's going to have, should have good success. We'll see. I'm not going to hold my breath, but uh, <clears throat> I think there will be at least one tree out of all of those that will survive 
and will become a very large tree without any protection. I think that's a very high possibility. Um, there is trees that have survived here, by the way. I had a hardy Chicago type that I got rid of for some reason. Don't ask me why, but it did survive here uh, a couple winters um, with very little dieback. It survived, and it was young. So, you know, that's clearly um, would have been a good tree to have in that location for sure. Um, and I could have had, a, I guess, a bigger tree at this point of that tree if I had stuck to my guns with that one. I thought it was easy. I thought this would be something that um, I thought they were all created equal, to be honest with you. But they're not. Malta Black doesn't survive nearly as well here. You know, Improved Celeste doesn't survive nearly as well here. The blue Celeste is one that has, I think, the highest potential of the Celestes. So we're going to plant that one as well. Um, the other thing I'm doing is planting or is uh, spraying them with some Dynagro this year, the Protect, which has got some silica in it, which should help with the cold hardiness. But also, it has some potassium in it. Potassium, there's a couple of theories out there that that's going to, if you feed them with potassium, it should increase their hardiness by quite a bit theory who knows uh, we'll see we're gonna spray them probably once a month for the duration of the season probably six sprays and uh, we'll call it a day and we'll see if that has any effect on the trees um, and that's it you know I think that's all I wanted to talk to you guys about a lot of expectations a lot going on oh one last thing the capper fig and the greenhouse and what else is going on in the greenhouse uh, I don't think I'm gonna get the the profici this year I think I'm gonna wait let those trees kind of mature a bit and then we'll do the profici the following year and introduce the fig wasp uh, next year um, no need to rush it um, I don't want to drive my friend crazy who lives in California that can send me the the Profici. Um, also, I have some trees in the greenhouse that uh, are being covered by lots of pots right now, and I don't know if they're really going to do anything this year other than grow. So um, hopefully they can get established. We get that Japanese Espaillé form to them. And then we can start uh, training them and hopefully this time next year though they're going to be growing in the greenhouse and I have some in-ground trees in the greenhouse um, we have a a, um, a tree in there panache that I don't think I want in there anymore so we're probably gonna plant something in there that is um, more conducive that has better uh, better humidity resistance because there's a lot of humidity in that greenhouse in the fall and uh, that's not something I want to deal with with these fruits is have um, you know an improper environment in the greenhouse it's just it's just gonna you know I'm not gonna have fruit quality like the fruit quality is gonna be really really bad with all that humidity so um, can't you can't you can't grow a panache in the greenhouse for sure um, just splits too much so yeah guys uh, that is the video here I hope everybody got something out of this enjoyed it uh, there's just so much going on as I said I mean we talked for an hour on this stuff or did we talk for two hours <laughs> uh, um, so yeah like I said I want to do a live stream episode I think next week um, we haven't uh, done it in a while and I, there's not really much going on a lot of you guys are home not doing anything so what better time is there than to do a live stream right so yeah we'll talk to everybody soon right if you guys enjoyed this one check us out on our blog figboss.com uh, Facebook and Instagram consider supporting us on patreon patreon.com slash Ross Ratty and also if you guys are interested in some consulting work we do that we have some videos on the consulting work for those of you guys who are interested 
and want to uh, make less mistakes um, in the future with your trees. So yeah, take care everybody. We'll talk to everybody soon and uh, see you for next week's episode. Hopefully we do a live stream. We'll let you guys know on the blog and social media. All right, take care.